Hello there. Last lecture was on the historical, cultural, social background to the Renaissance. So we're trying to sort of paint a big picture of, of the Renaissance. And in the background of that picture is uh, certain historical, social stuff. And now we are focusing in more on music. And I am going to be referring to pages 81, 82, 83 um, <clears throat> in the Camian text. And it states, the bottom of page 81, the Renaissance in music occurred between 1450 and 1600. Should be no surprise to us by this time. Um, now, it says, some historians place the beginning of the Renaissance as early as 1400. In fact, I would probably place it there too. But the dates that we're going to use are 1450 to 1600. Nice, even, clear-cut 150 years. I talked about the significance of several events that happened right around uh, during the 1450s. So the, the fall of Constantinople, the invention of printing uh, by Johannes Gutenberg, and the end of the Hundred Years' War. So I think that 1450 has, or 50, 1453 has been sort of the favorite date of historians for a while. <clears throat> but we can see uh, the, the ground being laid for the Renaissance really in the 1300s, and certainly in Italy, by 1400 or so, let's say in Florence, the Renaissance really is underway. It, remember, the Renaissance is a phenomenon that really begins in Italy and then spreads elsewhere into Europe. Okay, it says, As in the other arts, the horizons of music were greatly expanded. Whatever that means, we'll find out soon. The invention of printing widened the circulation of music, too, and the number of composers and performers increased. So remember I talked about how huge the invention of printing with movable metal type by Johannes Gutenberg. For example, how it contributed to the Reformation because Martin Luther, of course, one of his um, main beliefs was that people should read the Bible for themselves. And how are we going to make the Bible available to them by printing it using this new technology? And also how... Uh, the invention of printing not only lowered the cost of books, but it made it more worthwhile for ordinary people to learn to read because the cost of books were, was lower. But when books were terribly expensive, what would be the point in learning to read if you couldn't afford to own a book? So something very similar happens in music. Now the first guy to print music was a man named Petrucci, and uh, the invention of Printing music came shortly after, within a couple decades, of the invention of printing by Gutenberg. And because of that, now it was, it was much easier to obtain printed sheet music, and it made it more worthwhile for, let's say, maybe not exactly average people, but average educated people, let's say. Certainly, the nobility and the upper middle class. Now, the term middle class is a little bit problematic when we apply it retroactively to the Renaissance. But let's say um, skilled tradespeople, um, doctors, lawyers, uh, bureaucrats, these kind of people who are not members of the nobility, but are, let's say, working class, but upper working class. Those people now might take an interest in learning to read music or having their children take music lessons because there's so much more printed music available. Okay. Um, top of page 82, it says here, In keeping with the Renaissance ideal of the universal man, every educated person was expected to be trained in music. So, it was just considered part of an education, a necessary part of any education, that you be trained in music. That is, if you were educated during the Renaissance, then you were probably well-educated in music, right, among other things. 
to be well educated but have no musical training would, would seem strange uh, to the Renaissance mindset. Um, they mention here this book called The Book of the Courtier, 1528, by uh, Castiglione. Um, remember I talked a little bit about courtiers uh, when I talked about the, uh, the culture of, of courtly love in the uh, Ars Nova period or in the, uh, uh, the age of the troubadours. So remember what a courtier is. A courtier is someone who is of the noble class and is sort of hanging around in the court of some wealthy, uh, powerful member of the nobility, like a duke or a king. And for these people especially, being trained in music was very important because it made you the kind of person that a duke or a king would want to have around. It made you sort of a valuable person at court. And this book that they mentioned, the Book of the Courtier, was, was a bestseller in the 16th century um, because it was sort of like a, uh, kind of like the Renaissance equivalent of a how to succeed in business type of book. Um, now, the business of a courtier is ingratiating yourself with a duke or with a king and making yourself uh, pleasant to be around, maybe even sort of necessary to have around, so that you are in proximity to people who have power, right? And so this book, the Book of the Courtier, and others like it, it sort of trained people on how to act, how to behave, what skills to cultivate if you wanted to be a good courtier. Uh, for example, you should be, you should be witty, um, you should uh, be skilled in uh, reading poetry or writing poetry, you should be skilled in music, you should be athletic, you should be a good tennis player, right? all these kind of things. Um, and, and, and talking about manners, for example, appreciating the arts, all of this kind of stuff was considered vital to being a courtier in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance. And that, that meant that there was just that much more demand for uh, being, for music and being educated, being trained in music. It says here, as in the past, Musicians worked in churches, courts, and towns. Church choirs grew in size. For example, the papal choir in Rome, the choir of the Pope, uh, it, when he was, let's say, uh, attending his own chapel services in the Sistine Chapel. There's a, there's a choir to this day in uh, the Vatican, the papal choir in Rome increased from 10 singers in 1442 to 24 in 1483. So the, the courts of the nobility, remember, and, and it's the nobility that is increasing in power and wealth and influence during the Renaissance, while the church is declining, that is the Catholic church is declining in power and influence, the, the noble courts are hiring composers and musicians, not just for entertainment, but also for chapel services. If you are a king or a powerful duke uh, during the Renaissance, um, you do not go to church with ordinary people. You have your own chapel built into your palace or on the grounds of your palace. And then, therefore, you also need musicians to provide music for your chapel services. So the job of a court musician was to provide music not only just for entertainment, but also for uh, also sacred music for uh, worship services. It says here, the church remained an important patron of music, but musical activity gradually shifted to the courts. That is, if you could choose to be either a church musician or a court musician during the Renaissance, 
you would probably want to be a court musician because remember a court musician that means you're working for the nobility the nobility is on the rise now and that's where the more prestigious jobs would be now there there are still some very prestigious jobs working for the catholic church in fact we'll find out about one composer in particular uh, Palestrina, who was basically the court composer to the Pope. He had sort of the top musical job in the Catholic Church. Uh, and there were composers who, uh, at various points in their career, might, might have been a church musician and then got a job working for a duke or a count or a king, and then maybe uh, went back to working for the church. So there's some... Uh, you know, there, there's some career switching going on uh, between the sacred and the secular um, on the part of composers during this time. But if you could choose, you would probably want to have a job as a court composer that was higher pay, sort of more prestige, um, and also, of course, the flexibility to write both sacred and secular music. Whereas if you were a church composer, you were probably only going to write uh, sacred music. It says here, kings, princes, and dukes competed for the finest composers. So if you are really a, 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 a big name composer, for example, the first composer that we're going to look at, uh, Josquin de Pre, uh, the greatest composer of the early Renaissance, uh, he was famous enough that he was really in demand, and uh, there were several different high-ranking nobility who were trying to get him. It, was, it would be considered a prestigious thing to have a, a great composer like Josquin de Pre on your staff, right? So, uh, and this is true not just of music, but let's say, you know, for painters or architects or poets or whatever, the courts of the nobility uh, considered it, you know, very prestigious to have these, these great artists and writers and composers, and they were willing to pay top dollar for them. So if you were, you know, at really of the, the cream of the crop, you could command quite a high salary. But nonetheless, you would still be sort of like a servant. You would be on the staff of, let's say, a prince or a king or a duke or something like that. You would not be treated as an equal, but you would be treated as sort of a, 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 a high-class servant, in essence. And you would be told what kind of music to compose and when it needed to be done and uh, you know, what style it should be in, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so all of this is, uh, is there. To, I'm not just going to read through all of it, but I'm going to point out one other important thing. Right here at the middle of page 82, it says here, many leading Renaissance composers came from the Low Countries, in parentheses, Flanders, an area that now includes parts of the Netherlands, Belgium, and northern France. These Flemish composers were regarded highly and held important positions throughout Europe but especially in Italy, which became the leading music center in the 16th century. Okay, so um, the low countries, they're called that, they're, they are actually physically low, they are below sea level. We're talking about modern day uh, Netherlands, Belgium, maybe a little bit of northern France, Luxembourg. Um, if you're sort of familiar with the uh, the dikes of Holland, which hold back the North Sea, um, which during the late Middle Ages, uh, th that land was reclaimed and those dikes were built to hold back the ocean. And the famous windmills, you know, if, you're, if, you're, you, know, if you think of uh, Holland or the Dutch, you might think of windmills. The job of the windmills is to keep pumping water out of the ground, right? So you have a system of dikes and windmills um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. Much of, something like one-third of modern-day Holland is land that was once underwater, which was reclaimed uh, during the late Middle Ages by the system of dikes and windmills. 
Um, Holland, uh, during the Renaissance, or, or let, let's use the archaic term, Flanders, um, that's what they called it back then, this area, just modern day Netherlands and Belgium, um, this was a very prosperous and relatively sort of free and open uh, society uh, back during the Renaissance. Um, and for that reason, and probably for, for others, many of the greatest composers of the Renaissance came from that part of the world. And they have these kind of Dutch names like Josquin and Albrecht and uh, Achigam and uh, now, these guys were born in the Netherlands, but, but worked all over Europe, and as the book mentions, the most prestigious place to work for any creative person during the, during the Renaissance was Italy. You could get a job working for one of the, the uh, you know, the, the high-ranking Italian nobility, the dukes, counts, um, who, uh, were in charge of these uh, these Italian city-states. Now, this is before Italy was like a unified country. It was kind of a patchwork of republics and city-states and kingdoms and, um, and all of whose leaders were vying for each other, competing with each other to get the best talent. So that's where you would want to uh, land a job if you were during that time, but many of them came from the Netherlands, or as they called it back then, Flanders. And if we're talking about the Flemish composers, that is composers from Flanders, anyone from Flanders we refer to as Flemish. And remember, Flanders is just the old name for the Low Countries, uh, the Netherlands. By the way, Netherlands just means Low Countries. Nether means low and lands means lands. Netherlands means the low countries. Okay. Um, characteristics of Renaissance music. So we have a whole list of uh, sort of concepts, characteristics in orange print. So I would make sure you really understand each of these. I'm gonna to touch on each one of these things. And I want you to also think about how each one of these is either different from or similar to the music of the Middle Ages. Okay? So, first one they mention, words and music. And here we have sort of a, a similarity between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, because it says, in the Renaissance, as in the Middle Ages, vocal music was more important than instrumental music, right? So for both the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we have more vocal music being composed than instrumental music. Instrumental, purely instrumental music is really kind of a sideline, and we don't see instrumental music really take off and come into its own until the next era that we're gonna to get to, the Baroque era, next unit, right? So this is something that the Renaissance and the Middle Ages have in common. Vocal music, purely vocal music without instruments, is, is dominant. Uh, now, since we're talking mostly about vocal music, we need to pay attention to the relationship between the words and the music. It says here, the humanistic interest in language influenced vocal music, creating a close relationship between words and music. Remember now, the Renaissance humanists, uh, and the Renaissance itself as a sort of a, as an artistic movement, begins with poetry, begins with, um, for the most part, highly educated Italians rediscovering Latin and Greek and the great works of Latin and Greek authors, Roman and Greek authors from the ancient world, right? And these, these uh, you know, these humanist Italians wanted to, wanted to study that stuff and read it in the original 
Latin or Greek. So there's sort of a revival in Latin and Greek. Um, and so the Renaissance really begins as more of a, a phenomenon within literature and poetry than really in the visual arts or certainly music. But it affects music because when we are talking about Renaissance vocal music, uh, we are talking about either scripture, in the case of sacred music, or poetry, in the case of secular music, which is set to music. So we begin with the words, say the, you know, the word of, of God, the words of, in the Bible, or maybe the words of some poet, and then we set them to music. The words come first, and the job of the composer is to try to really express the meaning of the words, to try and highlight the meaning of the words as much as possible within the music, to use certain musical devices to highlight the meaning of the words. As, as we've talked about before, this is called text painting or word painting. And it's a big deal in the Renaissance, as it was in the Middle Ages, actually. It's something that Middle Ages composers did as well, and we'll see even more when we get into the next era, the Baroque. So um, word painting or text painting is something we're going to keep coming back to, and it simply refers to any time the composer really wants to highlight the meaning of the words by use of musical devices. Right? like the shape of the melody, or by a certain rhythm, or a certain harmony, or what have you. There are lots of ways of doing this, and we'll, we'll discover some of those as we look at specific pieces of music from the Renaissance. Uh, the texture, this is an important one, the texture of Renaissance music is chiefly polyphonic. A typical choral piece has four, five, or six voice parts of nearly equal melodic interest. Imitation among the voices is common. Each voice presents the same melodic idea in turn, as in a round. Okay, so uh, remember our three different textures. Monophonic, that means a single melody and nothing else. Polyphonic, uh, two or more melodies going on simultaneously, and homophonic. Homophonic means a single line of melody, which is the most important thing, but in the background there's also some like harmony or accompaniment, stuff that supports the melody. Well, Renaissance music is primarily polyphonic. A typical Renaissance work has multiple strands of melody going on simultaneously, and each melody is independent from the others and has its own shape. Right? And uh, this, is, this is the most difficult type of texture to compose in because each melody has to be beautiful on its own, but it also has to mesh well with the other melodies that are going on simultaneously. Right? Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the style of Renaissance music. In fact, the book says, the Renaissance is, uh, is sometimes referred to as the age of polyphony. That is, the age in which, or the era in which, polyphonic music sort of reached its, its peak. It says here, top of page 83, Renaissance music sounds fuller than medieval music. That is, it sounds richer, it sounds warmer somehow. Why is this? Well, for one thing, the bass register was used for the first time, expanding the pitch range to more than four octaves. So, in the Middle Ages, you had polyphonic texture, the last few hundred years of the Middle Ages, but um, the, the different voices that were making up the polyphonic texture were were generally kind of crammed into a fairly narrow range. And in the Renaissance, what we see is the composers start to exploit the bass range for the first time, which means the voices can be spread out a little bit more from each other and cover more of the pitch spectrum, right? Resulting in a richer, fuller sound. 
But even more important, it says here, with this new emphasis on the bass line came richer harmony. Renaissance music sounds mild and relaxed because stable consonant chords are favored. Triads occur often while dissonances are played down. Okay, here's what they're talking about. Do you remember when we, when we talked about the uh, great Ars Nova composer, Guillaume de Macho, uh, and we listened to uh, two of his works, which you might want to review, um, one sacred and one secular, the Mass of Notre Dame, sacred work, and Puis Con Oubli, Since I Am Forgotten, this sort of mopey, sad love song. Uh, both of which are polyphonic works. One of them is sacred, it's in Latin. The other one is secular, it's in French. But in both cases, I said, you've got some kind of strange harmonies going on. Uh, because as far as we can tell, um, medieval composers were not as concerned, at least, uh, this, again, just sort of a, an educated guess, Hard to, to read the mind of someone, you know, composing music 700 years ago. But if we if we look at if we listen to the music of the of the late Middle Ages, it seems that composers were not as concerned with what kind of a chord they were creating at any given moment, when the polyphonic texture sort of coincides on a bunch of different notes. So you've got a bunch of different voices at any given moment you've got a bunch of different pitches which form a chord. Okay, well, what kind of a chord is it? Um, medieval composers seem to be not as concerned with this aspect, this sort of like vertical aspect of polyphonic texture. They were more concerned with the horizontal, with the different melodic lines going on. But Renaissance composers were equally concerned with the different melodic lines, but also the chords that they formed at any given moment in time. So Renaissance composers were striving always to have triads, to have chords in which the tones blended well and sounded consonant. Now, um, they didn't always have consonant chords. There is dissonance in Renaissance music, but the practice of the time was to blend the dissonance in so smoothly that it wouldn't stick out and sound like strange or bad or clashing, right? And this was part of the training of every Renaissance composer in learning how to, uh, how to correctly deal with dissonance, uh, how to prepare the listener for a dissonant sound. That is how to ease into the dissonance and also ease out of it so that the dissonant sound, the dissonant harmony at any given point, doesn't stick out too much. Remember, dissonance is kind of necessary in harmony. It's sort of like, it, it, it introduces an element of tension and it's sort of like seasoning in food. Remember I, back in the, uh, in the first unit, uh, when we're talking about the elements of music and I talked about harmony, I compared it, I compared dissonance to like seasonings in food. Um, if you have too much, like if you have too much chili pepper or too much, you know, garlic or whatever, uh, it's going to, it's going to ruin the food, you know, so you don't want to have too much dissonance, but you have to have some, because if you don't have any seasoning in your food, it's going to be too bland, it's going to be too boring, right? So, uh, Renaissance music does have some dissonance, but it is dealt with so skillfully that, it, that the listener is hardly aware of it. It's very, very subtle. Right. Okay. Um, next paragraph, paragraph 2 on page 83, it says here, Renaissance choral music did not need instrumental accompaniment. For this reason... The period is sometimes called the golden age of unaccompanied a cappella choral music. Okay, so this is something that is true of both the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. 
most sort of like important music, that is music that is written down by a trained composer, is a cappella. It's vocal without instruments. We do have some instrumental music, as we will see. We have, for example, instrumental dance music. But instrumental dance music is sort of a sideline. It's something that, let, let's say, the most famous, illustrious composers of the time mostly didn't, didn't really bother with. In fact, a lot of instrumental music during the Renaissance was simply arrangements of vocal music, uh, music that was originally written for a cappella voices, but was later rearranged for instruments. Only when we get to the next era, when we get to the Baroque era, next unit, then we will see sort of an, an explosion in instrumental music, but not yet. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, vocal music is king. Okay, uh, rhythm and melody. It says here, again, the third paragraph, page 83, in Renaissance music, rhythm is more of a gentle flow than a sharply defined beat. Um, and uh, what, what they're talking about here is that, of course, there is rhythm in Renaissance music, but and there is a beat, but it's very subtle. It's not like toe-tapping music for the most part. First of all, again, since we're talking about mostly a cappella vocal music, there's no percussion going on to bang out the beat for you. And, you know, anytime we talk about beat or rhythm, I think, you know, people who've grown up listening to modern music or popular music, they tend to think of drums because, of course, the drums provide the beat and the rhythm and all that. But you can have a beat, you can have a rhythm without percussion. It's just not going to be as obvious if you don't have that drum set banging out the beat for you. So in Renaissance music, we do not have any drum set. Uh, composers did not really use percussion instruments for the most part. Um, and, I mean, remember, we're talking about mostly vocal music. So there is a beat and there is a rhythm, but it's, but it's very, very subtle, right? It's not music that you would naturally start tapping your foot to. Right? Um, also, remember how I said that in the late Middle Ages, during the Ars Nova period, one of the main characteristics of that style, that is, a, let's say, music of the 14th century, the 1300s, music of that time was very complex rhythmically because a new system of notation, a new way of writing rhythms had evolved and composers kind of exploited this new system to the max and they wrote music which was rhythmically complex pretty much just for the sake of doing so because they could. Remember I, I compared it to sort of like uh, getting a new Lego set, which has all kinds of different pieces and building all kinds of fantastical, complex stuff just because you can, whereas before you couldn't when you had the old Lego set, which only had two different pieces in it. Okay, so uh, that fad of writing rhythmically complex music for its own sake really ends with the Middle Ages. And as we move into the Renaissance, composers uh, simplify Again, they have the capability to write complex rhythms if they want to, but for the most part, Renaissance music is not overly complex rhythmically. The rhythm doesn't like call too much attention to itself. In fact, Renaissance music overall is extremely subtle. Right? Uh, it is extremely refined. It is extremely beautiful, I think. I, I think in terms of pure beauty, defined however you want to define it, but according to how I define it anyway, I think the music of the Renaissance is maybe the most sheerly beautiful music there is. Now, for some people, it, it, it might not be as exciting as other kinds of music, or as dramatic, or as overpowering, or whatever, but in terms of sheer beauty of sound, it's really hard to beat Renaissance music, and I think Hopefully you'll discover that as we start to listen to specific pieces. Um, it's beautiful, but it's very, very subtle. 
and there's nothing about Renaissance music that is like in your face or over the top or extreme. It's very refined, right? It's in keeping with sort of the, the overall values of Renaissance art, that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too extreme. It shouldn't be too flashy or too showy or, or overly theatrical or in bad taste, right? It should be beautiful above all else, right? Um, it shouldn't be overly emotional either. Now, we're used to music being, uh, you know, very emotional, expressing emotions, and certainly music of the Renaissance uh, does express emotions. But it doesn't express any ugly emotions, right? And it doesn't go emotionally overboard to an extent that might lead to, let's say, being in poor taste or being like, over the top, right? Beauty is absolutely like sort of job one for the Renaissance composer. And other things like expressiveness or, or whatever come later down the list of priorities. Beauty is always number one. Okay, um, now, the, the book then, from, from about the middle of it, page 83, gets into talking about sacred music versus secular music, and um, actually starts talking more in detail about sacred music, and then goes on to talk about secular music. So I'm going to deal with this next time. I'm going to wrap up this lecture fairly soon here, because I see I'm already 36 minutes in. But what I want to do is give you a little preview of uh, what we're going to be looking at for the next two lectures. So we'll have a lecture on sacred Renaissance music, and then we'll have a lecture on secular Renaissance music. Um, and um, remember this distinction. So sacred music is music that has something to do with uh, worship or praising God or you know use in some kind of religious service. And now it, that might mean the Catholic Church, or it might be might mean one of the Protestant churches. Right? Luther, for example, was you know, the, the uh, uh, Martin Luther, the instigator of the Protestant Reformation, was uh, a great musician himself, very conscious of the role uh, of music in worship, um, and had some very specific ideas about that. So music was very important within uh, the Lutheran church, still is to this day. Um, and then we've got secular music, music that has nothing to do with uh, worship. And um, we're going to see that, you know, secular music throughout, it seems like, you know, for time immemorial is mostly love songs. Okay, so on the sacred side, the two main genres of music are the mass and the motet. Right. So that's what we're going to spend most of the time talking about, the mass and the motet. The mass, that is, the mass as a type of musical piece, as you know, separate from the mass as a ritual within Catholic worship, there is such a thing as a type of composition called the mass. And what it is, is simply... When you take those five ordinary prayers, the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei, and you set those to music in polyphonic texture, usually in the Renaissance, right? That's what a mass is. Remember, that's what I said, the significance of Guillaume de Machaut's Mass of Notre Dame is. This is the first time back in the uh, mid-1300s Machaut's Notre Dame Mass, which is a piece we talked about back in the, in the Middle Ages, like a couple of lectures ago, that was the first time that a composer had looked at those five prayers and seen them as the potential sort of like uh, starting point for a composition, taking each of those prayers and setting them to music and, and presenting them as a unified whole, as a, as a five-movement composition. So that's what the Mass is. A motet is a shorter composition. You know, a Mass is kind of a big work. Five movements, 
right? Each movement may be being four or five minutes long so that overall it's, you know, it could be a 20, 25 minute long composition. A motet is a shorter single movement work. It's still vocal, a cappella, polyphonic, but it is some other devotional text or maybe a, a text drawn from the Bible, some kind of a sacred text set to music in polyphonic texture, which is not part of the mass, not part of the liturgy, right? Let's say you're a composer and there's a particular passage in the Bible that you really like and you think, wow, that's really beautiful. I want to set these words to music. I'm going to write a motet, uh, you know, based on just this, you know, these, these few sentences from the Bible. I'm going to set them to music. That's what a motet is. A motet is a shorter piece. You know, most, most motets are maybe four or five minutes long. We'll listen to an example of a motet by... Uh, Josquin de Pre, uh, this motet, Ave Maria Virgo Serena. It's an Ave Maria. It's a Hail Mary. It's a, it's a poem of praise to the Virgin Mary that has been set to music. Right. So that's what a motet is. We'll, we'll uh, look next time at an example of uh, a motet and a movement, one movement from a mass. Um, okay, and then you have secular works over here, right? And the most important secular works of the Renaissance are the madrigal, the lute song, and instrumental dance music. Okay, let's take the madrigal first. A madrigal is simply a love poem. It's love poetry set to music. Again, it's a cappella, it's in polyphonic texture, but it's going to be in some vernacular language. In the case of the madrigal, it's either going to be in Italian or English. There are two different types of madrigals. There is the Italian madrigal, which comes first, beginning around the 1520s or so. And then later, there are English madrigals. English composers and English poets begin to take up the idea of the madrigal after around 1588. I'll talk about why that is, why we have Italian madrigals and English madrigals. Uh, I'll talk about that two lectures from now when I talk about secular music. So we've got madrigals, love poetry set to music, usually for a, a small ensemble of between four and seven singers. Right? And, and each singer has their own distinctive melody. Right? So it's polyphonic for a small ensemble. It, some of them are sort of like barbershop quartet. If you're familiar with barbershop quartet, madrigals, some madrigals are kind of similar to that in style. Okay, then you've got lute songs. The lute was the most popular, one of the most popular instruments of the Renaissance. It was sort of like the Renaissance equivalent of the guitar. It's a guitar-like instrument. It has a, uh, you, you play it in a very similar way. It, it might have uh, more strings than a guitar. There are different types of lutes, but it has a, a shorter neck usually, and it has a, um, a rounded back, whereas a guitar has a flat back. But nonetheless, the guitar and the lute are kind of similar. The lute was very, very popular during the Renaissance, and uh, a lute song is a song that is either just for solo lute, in, in other words, an instrumental piece, or more commonly for singer and lute accompaniment. So you have a melodic line being sung by a singer, and then a lute part, which is just accompaniment. Uh, the greatest lute player and the greatest composer of lute songs uh, during the Renaissance was a guy named John Dowland. And we will uh, look at one of his songs, probably, you know, definitely his most popular song. This is probably like the, the, the greatest hit of the 17th century. This was for a very long time the most well-known song in the English language. It's called Flow My Tears. So we'll listen to that as an example of, an, of a lute song. And then you have, finally, instrumental music for dancing. 
And remember, back in the Middle Ages, we had instrumental music for dancing. We had the estampier, which was the popular dance in the 1100s, the 1200s, the 1300s in France. As we get into the Renaissance, there is more of this dance music being composed. And what we usually see is that dance music is composed in pairs, in, in, as two movement pieces. Usually it's a slower dance followed by a faster dance, right? So the dance pair is a popular genre uh, in the Renaissance. And uh, these slower dances, for example, like the pavan, it's a popular dance back then, would be followed by a faster dance like a galliard. The pavan and galliard was a, was a popular uh, dance pair. Um, in your book, uh, let's see, they, they talk about this toward the very end, and instead, they, instead of a pavan and galliard, they have a passamezzo and galliard um, as an example to listen to. Um, passamezzo means, literally means medium step. Passa means step, and mezzo means medium. So medium step, like not too, not too slow, not too fast. Remember, these dances in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance were, uh, you know, dancing back then was an important social activity, and uh, these dances had certain specific steps that you had to learn. And people danced in groups, and, and you had to know that step, otherwise you were going to step on people's toes and make a fool of yourself, right? So because these dances had specific steps, the music to accompany those dances had specific tempos, specific meters, specific rhythmic patterns that people knew. Okay, so uh, that's just sort of a preview of where we're going to be headed for the next two lectures. Next lecture, we'll talk about sacred music, and we'll talk about two composers in particular, the greatest composer of the early Renaissance, Josquin de Pre, and the greatest composer of the late Renaissance, uh, uh, Palestrina, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, who is probably the greatest composer that you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, well, you've heard of him now. And then, uh, final lecture, we'll talk a little bit about secular music, we'll talk about madrigals, and we'll talk about lute songs, and a little bit about instrumental dance music. Okay, so that's it. Two more lectures after this, and then we'll have our test. Right. So, see you this weekend for the next lecture. Bye.